Okay, so uh, I'm very happy to uh, you know have uh, Dr. Hyun Kim uh, as our uh, first speaker of uh, ABC seminar. Uh, you know this uh, the spring semester. So Hyun uh, has got his PhD degree from uh, KAIST in Korea, and uh, now he's a postdoc and uh, IBS uh, in Korea. So today, uh, well, uh, Hee-jung is an uh, expert on uh, dark matter physics and uh, cosmology. Uh, so he's going to talk about uh, so interesting uh, dark matter phenomenology uh, in terms of you know astro, uh, astro, astrophysics and uh, cosmology. So uh, please, Hee-jung. Um, thank you very much for the introduction, Jujin. Um, so um, first of all, thank you very thank you to you all for having me. Um, it is a great pleasure to give a seminar at the um, Texas A&M University. And as the title indicates, uh, I will discuss the imprints of elastic and exothermic scatterings of dark matter um, that can be seen in astrophysical and um, cosmological observations with an emphasis on the structure formation imprints. So before we dive into the contents, um, I, will let, I would like to let you know about the theme of this talk. Um, the main motivations is thinking about what the astro, astrophysical or cosmological observations can potentially tell us about the actual properties of dark matter. And what I mean by actual properties is that um, the dark matter interactions among themselves that are beyond the gravitational one. The examples are um, elastic self-scattering and the exothermic scatterings among uh, dark matter particles. So um, those dark matter interactions are by definition secluded from the standard model and thus may be most directly probed by looking at their imprints in the structure formation. Um, the particular length scale that I will be focusing on this talk is the small scales and which I will clarify what it means in the later part of this talk. Um, so I will be demonstrating what the observations like rotation curves of galaxies, motions of stars residing inside galaxies, and the cosmological observations like the Lyman Alpha Force observations uh, can, can tell us about the properties of dark matter. Okay, so this is the um, outline of my talk. So first I will be focusing on, uh, first of all, in this talk, I will be focusing on GEV or sub-GEV mass scale for dark matter. And what I mean by this is that I will consider dark matter particles lighter than a 10 GeV. So throughout the talk, uh, there will be places where I only exclusively talk about the sub GeV scale, uh, in which case I will not be using the parenthesis to afford this sub. And I will tell you my personal view on why sub GeV dark matter is can be interesting, and especially in terms of the structure formation. Um, next, I will tell you the, um, what the small scale observations uh, may be cap capable of uh, in, uh, uh, in telling us about the self-scattering na nature of dark matter. I will also explain um, how the exothermic processes of dark matter in collaboration with the self-scattering of dark matter can modify the halo structures. And I will tell you uh, what the observations on smaller size halos can say about dark matter exothermic scatterings. Um, in the final part of this talk, I will talk about the unique uh, early universe dynamics of dark matter in the presence of both the self-scattering and exothermic uh, processes of dark matter. Okay, so now um, let me uh, begin with the first part of my talk. Uh, why is sub-GB dark matter interesting? Um, so when it comes to thinking about top-down motivation for sub-GB dark matter, there isn't a strong motivation related to um, resolving the fundamental issues of the particle physics. Uh, but it certainly has a variety of bottom-up reasons why it would be interesting to think about sub-GB dark matter. Uh, first is that it accommodates the thermal freeze-out thermal freeze production of dark matter, where dark matter particles are initially in thermal equilibrium with the standard model and eventually depart, depart from it. Um, in such a case, the only physics around the time the freeze-out is relevant and thus to present day dark matter abundance is insensitive to the details at the UV. And since the mass is significantly lighter than the weak scale, it easily evades the conventional direct detection experiments that were originally uh, designed to detect dark matter particles um, at the electroweak scale. So also 
um, the high energy accelerator probes are as ineffective as uh, direct detection experiments because the missing energy signatures in the production of sub GB dark matter particles is hidden well below the uh, dominating backgrounds. So basically, there's a lot of parameter space for sub GB dark matter that have not been uh, probed yet, explored yet. Um, and excitingly, there are various new experimental strategies that are ongoing and coming in the, in the near future. And let me mention just one of the ideas because I will be discussing this um, in the latter part of my talk. So there are so-called missing energy experiments that search for missing energy events by scattering electron beam on target. In many of these uh, sub-GB dark matter scenarios, uh, once you assume a thermal freeze-out production of dark matter, it requires a light mediator that couples the standard model with the dark matter particles. So one example of such light mediator is the dark photon. So as shown in this figure, um, when an electron scatters with a nucleus, uh, it can emit a dark photon which decays into the dark matter particles if the dark matter is heavier, uh, I mean, sorry, if the dark photon is heavier than the twice of dark matter mass. So if we precisely uh, measure the energy of the electron and hydrogen showers, uh, we can identify the missing energy bands uh, caused by this production of dark photon. So while the um, accelerator-based experiments robustly probe the uh, sub gb dark matter parameter space, uh, there is an equally interesting direction to search for um, sub-GB dark matter. Uh, that is by looking at the structure formation imprints of dark matter. So let me um, tell you why sub-GB dark matter can be so interesting in this aspect. So due to um, the light mass, the sub-GB dark matter particles can naturally exhibit a large uh, self-scattering cross-sections. Um, and if we naively estimate the um, self-scattering cross-section per mass with assuming order one coupling. And one can find that uh, the self-scattering cross-section is strong enough to affect um, structures like galaxies. So let me mention a couple of uh, examples that I will discuss in this talk. Um, self-scattering among dark matter particles can form a central cores, uh, central constant density cores inside galaxies of various mass and also generate diverse density profiles of Milky Way satellite galaxies. So uh, once you find these features in the observations, and if you find that there's no other way of explaining them, it may be attributed to the actual properties of dark matter. So um, there are certainly more interesting aspects in the structural formation side. And if you're interested, um, you're, you may look into the uh, references that are shown in the site. Okay, so now let me start with the uh, second part of my talk, which is on probing the self-scattering nature of dark matter from uh, astrophysical observations. So I told you that I will be focusing on um, observations on the small scales. So let me start by uh, defining it. So this figure uh, shows the observed, uh, I mean, abundance of structures in various length scales which all agree with the uh, prediction of a collisionless and cold dark matter. The small scale that these observations probe uh, is around a mega per sec, which is equivalent to the distance traveled by light for a million years. Um, our interest lies in the scales much smaller than a mega per sec, and which I will call the small scales. And the structures are very compact and dense in these scales, and we may expect um, possible hints on the nature of dark matter. Sorry. Uh, right. So let me introduce uh, what structures we can see on small scales. The largest one is the um, galaxy cluster at a few megaparsec scale. Next to that is our own Milky Way uh, at a few hundreds of kiloparsec. And the smallest one that we can currently observe uh, are the satellite dwarf galaxies that orbit around the Milky Way. So my interest is looking for any hints of uh, dark matter self-scattering in these uh, structures of these galaxies. So I told you that the self-scattering of dark matter particles can leave observable imprints in the structures of these galaxies. So more precisely, um, the self-scattering of dark matter impacts the uh, structure of a dark matter halo uh, that embeds a luminous disk uh, that we call a galaxy. 
and you may wonder uh, how does it work. Um, the self scattering of dark matter gives rise to a macroscopic heat flow uh, inside galaxies. So initially, um, the uh, central region of a halo is cold, and the self scattering tends to um, conduct or transport heat to the central region of a halo. And consequently, the central region of a halo is heated and expands in volume and lowering and thus lowering the uh, density um, central mass density. So I will call this process core formation and such a process is very slow, <coughs> but can result in an <coughs> sorry, um, observable difference in the time scale of the age of the universe. Um, the core formation can be seen in present day halos if the self scattering happens at least once within the age of the universe. And if you, as you can see here, if you require the uh, self scattering time to be uh, of unity uh, within the age of the universe, uh, you can find that the uh, relevant cross section per dark matter mass is roughly around a centimeter square per gram. So now you may be wondering <coughs> how can we actually see the uh, central cores of dark matter halos in real observations? Um, one example of doing this is looking at the rotation curves. So for rotating gas rich galaxies, um, neutral hydrogen gas can act as a tracer for the total gravitational potential. And in the left panel, um, the black data points are the observation. And if you look at the blue line, which is the prediction for wimp dark matter, uh, it doesn't agree well with the observations in the central region. And this is because wimp uh, dark matter predict a cuspy central density. By the way, this figure, uh, the radius, I mean, x axis is the radius and the y axis is the uh, density. So if you're looking at a specific halo right now. And um, but for SIDM, I mean self-interacting dark matter, it predicts a constant density core, as you can see in this right panel, and thus making uh, the prediction for the uh, rotation curve in better agreement with the observations. So actually, it has been pointed out that the observed cores of galaxy clusters and dwarf galaxies in the field may prefer the self-scattering cross-sections as large as a centimeter square per gram. And this is one of the uh, accelerated figures you can see in the SIDM business, I mean, self-interacting dark matter business. So in this figure, uh, the each color data points uh, corresponds to an observed galaxy and shows uh, the preferred self-scattering cross-section. So you can see the contours for the constant uh, self-scattering cross-section. And x-axis is the velocity scale of the typical velocity scales of dark matter particles. So if you go from left to right, uh, you're basically considering a larger galaxies. So if you take the results of this figure seriously, um, um, if it is saying that the observations indicate that smaller galaxies prefer a larger self-scattering cross-section. So um, here, the blue and red data points, which are smaller than the green ones, I mean, smaller galaxies than the galaxy clusters, uh, they prefer uh, cross-sections cross around one centimeter square per gram, while the uh, galaxy clusters prefer uh, 0 0.1 centimeter square per gram. So this implies a velocity-dependent self-scattering cross-section. So now you have a rough picture on how uh, self-scattering of dark matter impact uh, halo density profiles. So now let us more get us get more involved. Uh, if you do an actual simulation for uh, the evolution of self-interacting dark matter halos, you can find that the central density um, decreased uh, at the early stage like this, uh, which is what we exactly discussed in the uh, previous slides. But after that, uh, after a certain point, um, the central density increase rapidly. So um, there are actually two, uh, so there's actually, you see that there's actually two distinct phases for the uh, halo evolution. So this implies that once you have an observed value, uh, observed core density of a halo, there are two possible phases that could explain it. Uh, so I will call the first phase as core expansion phase. And in the core expansion phase, the self-scattering works uh, to conduct heat into the central region, which results in the thermalization of the central region. And as a result, 
um, the constant density core is formed. And at the end of the core expansion phase, one notable feature is that um, the temperature distribution is, monoton is a monotonically decreasing function in radius. So from that moment, self-scattering works to transfer heat only to the outside of the hill. And this triggers the onset of the core contra contraction and collapse phase. Uh, so according to the Virial theorem, uh, the gravitating system has a negative heat capacity. So what this means intuitively is that if you think of a test particle and you apply uh, kinetic energy to it, what it's going to do is that it's going to move to a, another orbit that with a larger radius. But at the same time, the uh, circular velocity, I mean, the velocity of that dark matter test, test particle will decrease, implying that we have applied with the, so in summary, in summary, we applied kinetic energy, but as a result, the, um, the temperature of a particle has decreased. So this means that the gravitating system has a negative heat capacity. So if you think about this in a reverse process, uh, the outward heat, heat transfer would actually make uh, the core to shrink and become more hotter and hotter. So now that uh, we have some level of understanding on the uh, SIDM halo evolution, so let me introduce one of the recent interesting issues uh, related to the uh, self-interacting dark matter. So Milky Way satellites are one example. Uh, if you assume that they are uh, in the core contraction phase, uh, it, uh, they infer that um, SIDM cross-sections is as high as uh, 100 uh, centimeters square per gram around the scattering velocity of 10 kilometers per second, as shown by the cyan data points uh, in this figure. So some of you may already feel a bit uneasy from this uh, unusually small um, uncertainties in the data, but they're actually a reasonable with acceptable assumptions. So meanwhile, uh, I should mention um, that the, there are other groups that suggest the uh, self-scattering cross-section of three centimeters square per gram is enough. So while there needs to be a further investigation uh, to clarify which is the case, uh, what I and my collaborator did was to look, um, was to consider the former possibility and discuss the implications on dark matter models. So we pointed out that the um, data points are explained well if the uh, dark matter self scattering saturates the S wave unitarity bound uh, with a dark matter mass around 20 GB. So let me explain more about this. All right. Um, so let me start from the uh, general discussion of the uh, scattering cross sections. So for elastic scattering, um, one can decompose the cross section into the sum of cross sections uh, for the uh, scattering of spherical wave functions uh, indexed by the angular momentum number L. So here, uh, the delta L is the phase shift of the spherical wave function from the scattering. Um, at low energies, uh, it is reasonable to expect uh, that uh, the L equals zero, or in other words, S wave contribution dominates. Well, this is not always the case, but, um, but uh, in most of the cases, this is so. Um, and we may further apply the effective range approximation uh, in the low momentum limit and find that the cross section, the velocity dependence of the cross section is basically described by three parameters. So first is the mass of dark matter particles. And the second is the A, which is called the scattering length and RE, which is the effective range. So once we require uh, that cross section take the maximum value possible, which is the uh, called the S wave unitarity of the cross section, we find that the cross section has the velocity dependence of one over V squared. Um, so um, our observation is that this uh, particular velocity dependence of one over V squared fits well the inferred um, SIDM cross sections from the Milky Way satellites. If this is the case, uh, since the cross section is singly parameterized by the dark matter mass, if um, in the S wave, but in the limit of saturating the S wave unitarity, it pinpoints that dark matter mass should be around 20 GeV. 
Uh, furthermore, the requirement of S-way unitarity puts the model parameters into very special values. For example, if we consider a case where dark matter particles scatter through a light mediator phi, the coupling and the mass of the mediator um, is required to have very special values. And um, this uh, really pin down the model parameters when you do actual model building. Um, so, so far, I've discussed the case assuming that um, milk way satellites are in the core um, contraction phase. However, uh, one can also assume that the satellites are in the core expansion phase. And in this case, uh, there was an interesting result from um, Koei Hayashi and his nice collaborators that uh, Milky Way satellites um, prefer rather a small value of self spectrum cross-section around the velocities of 10 kilometers per second. So if we take their result um, seriously, it means that Um, so let me uh, expand more about this resonant self interacting dark matter. So if dark matter particles uh, scatter into a resonant state, uh, and if the resonant particle mass is slightly heavier than the twice of dark matter mass, uh, the dark matter would exhibit a resonant enhancement at a particular scattering velocity. And this is how the resonant self interacting dark matter could simultaneously explain the inferred cross sections from field dwarf galaxies and from the Milky Way satellite. Um, for example, the next generation spectroscopic surveys uh, will allow us to actually probe the structure of ultra faint dwarf galaxies. So these galaxies are satellite galaxies of the Milky Way, and are maybe they can they can be um, ideal objects to study um, dark matter microphysics since they are baryon poor, and we expect the baryonic processes to be negligible to the evolution of these halos. So if you look at this report from the Subaru PFS team, um, they give an interesting prospects on probing the um, dark matter, uh, self-scattering nature of dark matter by looking at these ultra faint dwarf galaxies. And also at the same time, the state, state of our simulations uh, will allow us to understand the impact of dark matter self-scattering on their structures. So let me wrap up the second part of my talk. Um, by summarizing the potentially interesting directions that I'm thinking about. So as I've shown you, we don't know what's really going on uh, with these um, SIDM interpretation of the structures of Milky Way satellites. And it would be important to clarify this since either of the uh, possibilities uh, gives very distinct uh, implications on dark matter microphysics. And since we expect new accurate information um, about the Milky Way satellites to come soon, um, it is timely to think about what the upcoming observations could really tell us. And we can ask if there, if there are um, observable futures that only a um, specific SIDM models will show so that we can distinguish different models from upcoming data. And of course, in order to do so, it would be very helpful for interpreting the data if we have a semi-analytical modeling of the halo structures in different uh, self-interacting dark matter models. But at the same time, it would be important to keep in mind that uh, there may be no new physics. So it is important to understand the uncertainties um, in the astrophysical data and also understand the validity of the assumptions that we're making. Um, Okay, so all right. Um, so far, I've discussed the evolution of halos when there's only the elastic scattering of dark matter. But, 
but we can ask the same question when there are also inelastic or exothermic processes of ferric matter. And to tell the answer first, um, the exothermic scatterings also can lead to poor formation of halos, although it happens through a different mechanism. So in the presence of a sizable cell scattering of dark matter, a feeble exothermic scatterings of dark matter could appreciably enhance the pore formation. So exothermic processes like the semi um, produce energetic dark matter particles, which are then captured by the cell scattering before leaving the halo. The captured energy is used to heat the dark matter halo and lead to the volume expansion of the central region um, and we dubbed this process as dark matter self-heating. So when this dark matter self-heating is accumulated for the age of the universe, uh, it results in the core formation like in the case of uh, self-scattering of dark matter. But, um, but uh, this, uh, and I should mention that this mechanism was first uh, considered by Xiaoyong Chu and Camila garcia Selly, And what I, I and my collaborators did was to do the numerical analysis more consistently and sharpen the prediction of dark matter self-heating. Okay. So again, in order to check if dark matter self-heating is efficient enough to impact halo structures, it's always good to start by comparing relevant dynamical time scales. So we can define a heating time scale uh, during which a dark matter particle receives kinetic energy that is comparable to its original kinetic energy. So basically I define the um, heating time scale through by multiplying the rate of the exothermic scattering and by times the captured energy per exothermic scattering. So delta E is the um, energy release from a single exothermic scattering and xi is the efficient efficiency to capture it. And we divide this by the typical kinetic energy of dark matter uh, particles inside the halo. And by taking the inverse, this defines the uh, heating time scale. So let me comment a little bit more about the capture efficiency xi here. Um, so xi parameterized the efficiency to capture a boosted dark matter particle from exothermic scattering. So since we're interested in the evolution of a central region of the halo, we can estimate the capture efficiency by dividing the core size with the mean free path of a dark matter particle defined through the cell scattering. And we can see that uh, actually a small, very small, tiny fraction of boosted dark matter particles are captured, uh, is captured. So now that we have defined the heating time scale, we can now ask if the heating time scale is actually comparable to the age of the universe. Um, so let me plug in actual numbers. Um, for the structural parameters of the halo, I took the, um, um, the values for the dwarf galaxies of mass 10 to 9 solar mass. And for the um, particle physics parameter, I took the exothermic scattering cross-section as roughly a one picobond, or in a more familiar unit, uh, 10 to minus 26 centimeter cubic per second. Uh, having in mind the thermal freeze out of uh, production of dark matter. And we can confirm that uh, with these uh, cross with these values of cross sections and the dark matter mass around an MEB, um, self interacting dark matter halos can be sensitive to exothermic scatterings. So another thing to em emphasize is that the effect of dark matter self-heating is expected to increase uh, towards smaller size halos. And this is because while the energy injection rate doesn't uh, change much among dark halos of different masses, the typical kinetic energy of dark matter particles changes with respect to the halo mass. For example, typical kinetic energy of a dark matter particle is smaller in smaller size halos. And thus smaller size halos respond more sensitively to dark matter self-heating. And we can confirm this through the um, halo mass dependence of the uh, heating time scale. So you can see that the heating time scale is shorter for uh, smaller halos. So now let me show you the actual numerical results for the halo evolution by taking the uh, semi annihilation of dark matter as an example for the um, exothermic uh, process. So in this figure, the x-axis is the halo mass in the units of the solar mass. 
And the y-axis is the core density. So if you move from top to bottom, uh, it means that the resultant halo at present exhibits a larger cores. And similar to the plots that I shown before, uh, the data points uh, correspond to individual galaxies. And we see that uh, the tendency uh, is that the smaller halos <clears throat> exhibit larger cores. So now let me put in the results for purely self-interacting dark matter with constant self-sketching cross-sections. And it shows that with a constant value of the self-sketching cross-section, the core formation effect is a virtually uh, halo mass independent. <coughs> Sorry. Now the orange curve uh, is the is our result is our prediction with the uh, simulation cross section of around one picobahn, and the dark matter mass is around one MeV. And by the way, I will assume a constant uh, self scattering cross section of uh, zero point one centimeter square per gram since we need it to capture the boosted dark matter particles. Um, we see that. In the uh, structures as large as uh, galaxy clusters, the core formation is basically determined by the um, self scattering of dark matter. But as we consider um, smaller size halos, um, we see that the core formation effect um, quickly escalates. And this is because the core formation effect is determined from the by the self -heat, dark matter self heating. And uh, in this self-heating dominated regime, we can find that the core density scales inversely proportional to the halo's age. Uh, and this is a very interesting point, uh, since in purely self-interacting dark matter models, that is, there is a minimal core density that you can achieve. Uh, as I mentioned, explained before, this is precisely because of the um, uh, as self-interacting dark matter halos exhibit the core contraction and collapse phase. But on the other hand, um, there is no such limit uh, if the core formation is governed by the dark matter self-heating. And self-heating just drives the core density to lower values indefinitely. And since the effect of um, self-heating is more dramatic towards uh, smaller size halos, uh, we may even differentiate a pure SIDM uh, and the self-heating dark matter uh, by observing this uh, smaller size galaxies, smaller size halos. And at the same time, we may use the um, observations on the uh, smallest halos to give the strongest constraint on dark matter self-heating. So by taking the semi uh thermal freeze-out dark matter as an example, we have shown that the observed central densities of um, Milky Way satellites provide a lower bound on the uh, dark matter mass as uh, 3 MeV. So now uh, we understand that the collaboration of exothermic uh, scattering and the elastic self scattering of dark matter, I mean, elastic self scattering of dark matter may heat the dark matter particles as a whole inside dark matter halos. But the same thing can also happen in the early universe. And in, the fi in this final part of my talk, I would like to discuss the um, cosmological dynamics of dark matter in the presence of dark matter self-heating. Um, so let me stop for a moment and remind the ingredients for the dark matter self-heating that we've discussed. Um, first, we want the exothermic process to release an uh, appreciable amount of kinetic energy. And we, uh, we also want the appreciable strength of uh, self scattering cross section uh, to uh, share the excess kinetic energy among other dark matter, to other dark matter particles. And these features are often realized uh, in scenarios of sub GB non minimal dark sectors models, uh, since the uh, strong self scattering is nat natural in sub GB mass scale and the non minimal particle contents and interactions. Uh, they often exhibit exothermic processes. Um, and I would like to discuss uh, one example today, uh, which is the scenario of multi-component dark matter. So first, um, oh, sorry. So first, uh, let me introduce a simple setup for uh, multi-component dark matter. So you may have seen this pipe figure probably a, a thousand times uh, from the observations of 
uh, CMB and isotropies, we know that uh, roughly 80% of the dark uh, mass energy of the universe is dark matter. And our practical viewpoint on dark matter is just a bulk of matter that's dominant in mass. Um, but um, it's not surprising uh, that the dark, if the dark matter contents can be as complex as ordinary matter and the non-minimality of the contents can have important consequences on the cosmological dynamics. Um, so we already know one example in the standard model. So although the baryon is dominant in mass, uh, there are electrons that play a very important role in forming the um, baryon photon fluid. So in this example, um, since the electron is lighter, it couples more strongly to the photon bath and thus it connects baryons with the photon bath. Um, to uh, represent the simplest case of multi-component dark matter, we think of a two-component dark matter case. Here, um, the chi zero is the heavy state and chi one is the lighter state. And we assume that the chi one has a dominant interaction with the standard model. So this is a very simple setup and there are many, but there are many different interesting differences from the case of single component dark matter scenarios. And in this final talk, part of my talk, I would like to clarify the cosmological dynamics of this two component scenario and highlight the differences uh, from a single component case in terms, especially in terms of the detection of dark matter. And I, oh, and I um, would like to emphasize that um, I will be focusing on the uh, sub GB uh, dark matter. since it's the case where we can expect strong self scattering cross section. So to, to, to make the um, discussions more concrete, let me employ a toy example with the dark photon portal. So in this example, um, Kai-1 is the only one that is um, charged under the dark U1. And the corresponding dark gauge both on A prime is uh, kinetically mixes with the standard model photon. And I will assume that both Kai-0, uh, which is the heavier component, and chi one, which is the lighter component, lighter component, lighter state, are complex scalars, and assume that the dark photon mass is heavier than the twice of the mass of chi one. And in such a case, uh, the relevant processes for the dynamics of the dark sector are the following. So first, I assume that heavier component um, annihilates into the lighter state. Um, through the S wave process. And since I assume the dark photon portal, uh, the scalar K1, complex scalar K1, chi1 annihilates into the standard model through a P wave process. The final important piece uh, is that the chi1 must exhibit a strong self scattering through the dark photon exchange. And one can confirm that the self scattering cross section is sizable for the sub GB masses. So, and I will implicitly implicitly assume this toy example in the following discussions. So before we dive in to the and discuss self-heating, uh, let me discuss a little bit about a dark matter abundance. And since there are clearly features that are distinct from the single component case, um, the dark matter abundance of chi zero and chi one is determined by the freeze out of these processes. And one can analytically or numerically estimate the final abundance of dark matter. And these are the evolution equations that you want to solve. If you're not familiar with them, that's okay. I will simply present the conclusions. Um, so when the um, final relic of the dark lighter state, it, so the final, final relic of the lighter state is the dominant over the heavier state, the freeze out of both chi zero and chi one proceeds, proceeds as usual. So what I mean by usual is that the freeze out proceeds as if dark matter, there are um, two dark matter components that are individually going through a WIMP-like freeze out. Uh, so, uh, sorry, uh, I forgot to uh, explain what this figure means. Uh, the Y axis is the co-moving number density of each dark matter components. And X axis is dark matter mass chi, M chi one over T, which basically uh, corresponds to time. So the uh, if we um, uh, the if we try to find the canonical values of the annihilation cross section to realize the desired 
uh, readily abundance, uh, it scales like this. So basically, the cross sections are inversely proportional to the desired abundance ratio. So R1 is the abundance ratio, is basically um, the abundance of chi1 over the total uh, dark matter abundance. But when you consider a subdominant uh, abundance of the lighter state, the estimation completely changes. This is basically because since the abundance of chi1 is so small, the production of chi1 from the chi0 annihilation becomes important. And we need larger annihilation cross-section to deplete away the chi1 particles to the desired value. And I will call this the assistive regime because the abundance of chi1 is assisted by the chi0 annihilation. So as you can see in this figure, you can, you can, um, you can clearly see the difference between uh, the um, one taking into account the assisted production of chi1 and the one that uh, uh, artificially turns off the chi1 production from the uh, chi0 annihilation. Um, so once you, once you work out the math, it shows that the required annihilation cross-section of the lighter state uh, scales as one over R to the cubic, which is a dramatic change from the single component scenarios. Um, so let me talk about the scaling of the required annihilation cross-section a bit more, since it has the interesting consequences in the detection signals of the lighter state. Um, I've told you that the in the case of P-wave annihilation of chi1, the required annihilation cross-section scales as one over um, R1 to the cubic in the assistive regime. And this implies that uh, it is actually easier to detect subdominant chi1. So for example, in direct detection experiments, the signal rate is um, the number density times the um, scattering cross-section times the velocity. And we assume, if we assume the heavy mediator limit, uh, we can find that the direct detection signal rate is actually enhanced for smaller uh, abundance fraction. The same uh, can be seen for the indirect detection experiments where import, basically the important quantity is the volumetric annihilation rate of dark matter. So now let us um, discuss the dynamics of the uh, after the freeze out. So even after the freeze out, there are still feeble number of chi zero annihilations into chi one, which produces uh, boosted chi one. And at the same time, we know that there is inevitably um, um, the strong self-scattering cross-section in the toy example that I mentioned. So this self-scattering efficiently redistributes the excess kinetic energy of the boosted chi1 and heat the chi1 system as a whole. So due to this heating of chi1, uh, the P wave annihilation of chi1 can be enhanced in cosmological epochs that are sensitive to dark matter annihilation. And moreover, um, the heating makes <clears throat> the subtributary dark matter particles behave as warm dark matter. So, um, oh, sorry. So, so if you follow the uh, temperature evolution of chi1, this figure is the result. The y-axis is the temperature ratio between the chi1 and the standard model, and the x-axis is m chi1 over the standard model temperature. So let us um, have a look at the solid line, uh, solid curve, which is the case for the abundance ratio of 0.1. So around x equal 100, uh, the kinetic decoupling happens um, since the chi1 elastic scattering between chi1 and standard model particles become inefficient. And from that point, the chi1 temperature doesn't have to follow the standard model temperature anymore and dynamically generates its <coughs> own temperature from the self-heating. And eventually, you can see that the temperature ratio reaches a constant value um, and for any values of the abundance fraction. So uh, now one may ask, until when the uh, self-heating epoch persists? The self-heating epoch ends when the self-scattering among dark matter particles becomes inefficient. And from that moment on, the dark matter particles are basically free streaming and the temperature redshifts as one over A squared, where A is the scale factor of the universe, and which is what we expect for the uh, non-relativistic non free streaming particles. So, okay, um, so now that we have discussed the dynamics of dark matter, uh, let me uh, comment on the um, various constraints on chi1. To better contrast the impact of self-heating, uh, let us review the constraints while turning off 
the self-heating by hand. Uh, keep in mind that we're focusing on the case of um, P-wave annihilation of Kaiwan, but also at the same time, there is always a unsuppressed um, S-wave part of the annihilation, which is represented by this diagram. Um, <clears throat> okay, so first constraint on Kaiwan is the CMB constraints on dark matter annihilation. So dark matter annihilation around the last scattering affects the ionization history of the universe and thus impacts the CMB photons that are traveling to us. So by requiring that the temperature power spectrum of the CMB is not so affected by the dark matter annihilations, we can get an upper bound on the volumetric dark matter annihilation rate at the time of the last scattering. And in this figure, we assume that um, um, we assume that chi zero mass is 30 MeV and the X axis is the ma mass of chi one and the Y axis is the abundance fraction of chi one. And we can see that there's no constraint on the P wave annihilation itself, uh, except for the minimal S wave contribution. And there's no constraint for the P wave peaks because since it's velocity suppressed. Uh, well, um, and again, yeah, there's a, um, the constraint from the SWPs of the annihilation. Okay. Um, yeah. So the next one is the BBN constraints on or so called photo dissociation constraints, which basically require that dark matter annihilation do not mess up the abundance of primordial light elements. The dark matter annihilation into electromagn electromagnetic particles could induce. Uh, electromagnetic cascade that produces uh, abundant energetic photons. And these energetic photons may dissociate the light elements with uh, small binding energies like the deuteron. So as a result of uh, volumetric annihilation with rate between uh, the standard model temperature of 100 electron volt to 10 kV is constrained. Um, and of course there are direct detection constraints. Um, and this plot, uh, this plot is, in this plot, we show the direct detection constraints in the brown. Okay, so now let me consist consistently take into account the dark matter self-heating. The left panel is the result, and the right panel is uh, for turning off the self-heating by hand. And you can immediately see some differences. So let me go by go through them one by one. Uh, first is the CMB and the BBN constraints. So without the dark matter self-heating, we can see that uh, P wave annihilation was not, is not constrained. But with, by consistently taking into account the dark matter self-heating, uh, we can see that there appears a constraint for a very subdominant uh, chi-1 abundance. Okay, great. Right. Um, so this is basically because the dark matter self-heating uh, enhances the uh, annihilation rates during the uh, epochs of photo dissociation and at the last scattering by raising the temperature of uh, dark matter. Um, we have also have we also have the warm dark matter constraints since chi one particle behave as warm dark matter. So the total dark matter consists of a cold component, which is the chi zero, the heavier state, and the warm component that is uh, chi one, the lighter state. And the cosmological observations like the Lyman alpha four theta constrains the warmness of this some um, subcomponent chi one. And once you uh, one feature that we, you can see in this plot is that. Uh, warm dark matter constraints become stronger for um, stronger self-scattering. Since stronger self-scattering means longer duration of the uh, self-heating epoch and thus results in a warmer chi-1. And there's one interesting impact on direct detection experiments. Uh, since the resultant warmness of chi-1 particles also could suppress their clustering at the and inside our own galaxy, there's a permitter region where direct detection constraints are relaxed, as you can see in this figure. Okay, so finally, um, let me comment, comment a little bit more about the um, warm dark matter constraints, especially in terms of the relation to the uh, parameter space probe by uh, exerted based experiments. So I briefly talk about the missing energy experiments at the beginning of my talk. So let me repeat it again briefly. So in the experiment NA64, they collide electron beam on target. And from the collisions, we may produce dark photon through a uh, Bram-Strahlung emission of the dark photon. 
And if dark photon mass is larger than the twice of dark matter mass, uh, it invisibly decays into dark matter. So by precisely tracking the uh, energies of standard model particles, you can indirectly probe these missing energy events. And the constraints on the kinetic mixing uh, parameter is determined uh, by the production cross-section of the dark photon. And this explains the slope of the constraint here. Uh, by the way, this the y-axis uh, y axis is basically the kinetic mixing and the uh, x-axis is the dark photon mass. So uh, at the same time, the parameters that realize the correct relative abundance are also determined by the alienation cross-section, which has the uh, same parameter dep dependence to the production cross-section in the NA64 experiment. And this is why the, uh, uh, the slope of the constraint and the thermal relic parameter have the, are nearly par parallel to each other. So let me start with the usual case of single component dark matter. Um, the gray regions are the region that is excluded from the missing energy momentum experiments. And the blue region uh, here is the uh, SIDM constraints on merging cluster. So basically if we have two strong self-scattering, uh, the merging of the clusters, the merging clusters would lose too much mass. And the black curves here uh, are the thermal relic parameters with a given value of uh, Ma prime over M chi one. So one thing I would like to mention is that the SIDM constraints directly probe the self-scattering nature of dark matter. But once we assume the dark photon portal, so do the accelerator-based uh, experiments. So as we decrease the abundance fraction of uh, chi-1, uh, we will quickly lose the SIDM constraints since only a portion of dark matter is self-interacting. But at the same time, we start getting the warm dark matter constraints uh, shown in pink regions. And note that while uh, warm dark matter constraints probe the parameter region that is complementary to the um, uh, missing energy experiments, it is also capable of telling us other information about dark matter which is the relation between the chi-1 and the rest of dark matter, since the warm dark matter constraints directly stems from the exi uh, existence, existence of the interaction between the heavier component and the lighter component. Okay. So as we further decrease R1, we see that the thermal relic curve starts to exhibit a break in the slope. This is basically because the freeze-out transits into the assisted regime where we require larger um, epsilons, larger couplings to realize the desired dark matter abundance. So here I assume that chi zero mass is 100 MeV, but as we increase the chi zero mass, the warm dark matter constraints basically vanish. But at the same time, for chi zero mass as large as a GeV, the boosted dark matter constraints from large volume uh, neutrino experiments become relevant. And it would be nice to put together the boosted dark matter constraints with the um, warm dark matter constraints in the same plane. So furthermore, and we may ask if there's any prospects for boosted dark matter constraints or sub GB mass scale of chi zero as well. All right, so let me summarize my talk. Uh, I've shown that the uh, sub GB dark matter naturally exhibit astrophysically interesting self-scattering strength. And thanks to the quickly improving astrophysical observations and simulations, I believe that it's timely to study what the upcoming observations will be able to tell us about the microphysics of dark matter. And one example that I've discussed in the observ um, is the obser observed structure of Milky Way satellites and its implication to the self-interacting dark matter models. And it's also important to keep in mind that all astrophysical observations may not necessarily mean that the dark matter should, self, uh, should exhibit self-scattering. Um, what I mean is that it is important to understand the uncertainties in interpreting the data and assumptions that we're making. And I have shown that self interacting dark matter halos can be sensitive to exothermic processes of dark matter, and observations on smaller size halos can constrain the dark matter self heating and maybe differentiate purely self interacting dark matter and self heating dark matter. The uh, same mechanism can also be uh, important in the early universe. And by taking the two component dark matter scenario as an example, I demonstrated that we can often realize models where dark matter self-heating should be taken consistently taken into account. And I've discussed various impacts of dark matter self-heating on dark matter detection, detection, and notably the warm dark matter constraints from dark matter self-heating are complementary to the missing energy experiments and further provide information about the relation between the chi-1 and the rest of dark matter. 
And there are uh, many aspects, uh, prospects, sorry, there are many prospects for improving the warm dark matter constraint. And at the same time, it would be great to think about the uh, boosted dark matter detection on the sub GB mass scales. Okay, so thank you very much for your attention. This is the uh, end of my presentation. Okay, uh, thank you so much for a very uh, interesting talk. Uh, so now, uh, questions for uh, Ijung? I, I can ask just a quick question um, about yeah. some of the galaxies you looked at. So you, you had like right, a right. plot of um, like core size versus mass, I think. Okay, okay. Um, and you said it was like flat. Like, what, do you know what, like, yeah, what, like, let's see, what like went into this galaxy sample here? I mean, there's like some that appear like dwarf galaxies, some that appear like clusters. Right, right, right. So, the green so like, I mean, this is not, I mean, this is not like all the galaxies that exist in the universe, of course. So like where, like, are these ones, like what made it into the sample, I guess, this was my question. Oh, okay, okay. So um, first of all, the, um, I think I can answer this question by um, what this uh, galaxy samples mean. Um, so they're basically from things. So they're, the red ones are, um, the um, dwarf galaxies in the field and blue ones are the low surface brightness spiral galaxies in the field mm -hmm. and also the green points are the galaxy clusters okay and that's obviously just a sub so um okay. i i think there's like yeah i mean just curious to see like which which galaxies like made made it onto this figure because i think there's like more scatter in, uh -huh, uh -huh, in, uh -huh. in these samples than sometimes is, is is being shown here so um right 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 i completely agree with you so yeah. um so there's a recent work um, on uh, using the isothermal genes modeling to, and right. by employing the isothermal genes modeling, they um, take into account more samples. And you can see actually see a lot of scatter. Yeah. Um, yeah and, and it's really hard to see the uh, tendency in those. In, in yeah, the, no, I mean, I know, I know the point, I understand the point you're driving at here, but I'm, I'm just kind of curious, yeah. like what made it into this cut here? Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, okay, I, I guess, I guess this, okay, so I guess, so these data points are from the, um, you know, these, um, is it from Kaplan Gad or something? Or what, yeah, 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 yeah. The, the original papers. Uh, so, yeah, I agree with you. I mean, this is, figure is very old, and it's true that it's unfair in some sense because they saw very small uh, samples. But yeah, as you said, I completely agree with you that if you okay. want to you take into account a large number of samples, it's really hard to see the tendency. You know? Yeah. Okay. No, no, I'm not. I'm not quarreling with the with the point you're trying to make here. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But I mean, it's also my interest to uh, really um, analyze the new data and. Try to feel it myself. I feel my, feel it, feel that, feel the uh, uncertainty in the data. I mean, it's really my, really my interest to look into that direction as well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That no, was nice talk. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Okay. So, other questions? Uh, so, Pasca, you have a question. Yeah. yeah. So, very nice talk. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I have a question for you. So, uh, mm -hmm. what's the indirect detection uh, possibilities for your uh, dwarfs, like for your second scenario, where you have this uh, boosted and then you have mm -hmm. this uh, subsequent uh, mm -hmm. uh, annihilation. So would that, like, a, like a, I, I see that, but the question that is, uh, would you distinguish between the signals from dwarfs and the galactic center based on this annihilation scale theory? because uh, you have two stage. First stage, something is getting boosted. So would mm -hmm. it leave the uh, dwarf galaxy uh, and then, but still it's within the uh, Milky Way, uh, uh, our, uh, our galaxy like a regime so that we, we see. Uh, and so mm -hmm. that, uh, M31 has some uh, kind of, uh, uh, possibility of excess in the outer region. So uh, mm -hmm. I was trying to think of a scenario like this, like a boosted and then mm -hmm. subsequent annihilation that would uh, create a signal, but we should miss that wall. So can it happen in your case? Um, okay, so I'm not, uh, I, I'm not sure if I understood your um, okay. question, but I, th I think you're talking about the case where um, there's uh, this um part, this boosted particle uh, travels to the right. uh, yeah the outskirt of the halo and then right. Right. right right so uh, you are using uh, different cross section scales would mm -hmm. that match that that means I bypass the dwarf constraint because it's boosted leaving the dwarf 
and mm -hmm. okay. that produces annihilation and signal. But for mm -hmm. Milky Way, it's fine. But for mm -hmm. dwarf, I would miss it. And uh, probably M31, it's even better. I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. 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 Like. okay. Okay. I understand your question. So, uh, okay. So basically, my answer to that question is that um, we need to. Okay. So that that is that is a really interesting possibility. So. Um, so basically, in my scenario, um, what I'm thinking about, what I'm considering is, um, you know, this um, this mass mass. I mean, the mass deficit from a single boost on uh, exothermic scattering is mm -hmm. like order one in the units of m chi. So this means that the um, the um, dark, the boosted dark matter particle is really relativistic. So basically, right. the um, the velocity is larger than the um, any escape velocities of this uh, Milky Way or the dwarf galaxy. Mm -hmm. um, so, but 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 um, information, if we consider um, right. the small mass mass gap case, it would be very interesting. I mean, and I think right. um, that's the case for inelastic dark matter models, right? Like when you have right. to so yeah, somewhat yeah. inelasticity would give mm -hmm. you that possibility. You may want to check mm -hmm. that, like uh, yeah, mm -hmm. there are some uh, M thirty one signals. Uh, Mm -hmm. But anyway, so that's one. And the second one, mm -hmm. okay. for, uh, for your ineffective, uh, uh, I saw some uh, analysis by, uh, so I guess you are, uh, are you including, uh, so how, how you are estimating the ineffective? So is it the annihilation into only the um, right. Uh, like what's the raising the temperature? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Also lowers the temperature. Right, right, right. There, due, okay. right, right. You're you're yeah. perfectly right. So there are two cases. So either the um, dark matter particles uh, exclusively unleaded into electromagnetic particles or right. into the neutrinos. Right. Okay. Yeah. In this case, I assume uh, electrophilic case. So we ah, only because, uh, okay, yeah. I see. Because yeah, like, yeah. if you use a combination, then you can remove this end effect. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're, I agree with you. Yeah, you're perfectly right. Yes, yes, yes. So and actually, yeah. what's the constraint from NS64 for that kind of scenario? Do you know? Um, you mean in my scenario? No, no. Like if I have a right end effect by using the combination, by using some, uh, you know, for any value of MA prime, like what could be an NS64 constraint for that kind of scenario? Um, because you need a balance yeah. between you know electromagnetic coupling and the relativistic degrees of coupling to uh, uh, you know like mm -hmm. and to satisfy an effective for a, any a prime mass. Do you know like a, by any chance uh, have you uh, um, into the NS64? Uh, sorry, I think I didn't understand your question. So, um, so maybe I understood the part that if you uh, control the couplings uh, to the neutrinos or electro electromagnetic particles, um, you can kind of evade the ineffective constraints. Ineffective constraints, but right. So, but what's where, the impact? How, like, uh, do I uh, see N64 is also probing the electromagnetic and the neutrino coupling because it's a missing. Ah, uh, okay. You're probing exactly that scenario. Ah, okay, so okay, okay, okay. So let me answer that question. So uh, in this case, um, I assume that the dark matter particles, um, I mean, sorry, the dark photon exclusively decays into dark matter particles. So okay, no, uh, I see that. Yeah, Probably yeah. that's uh, yeah. I know. But the yeah, if we ha uh, if you want to constrain the visible decays, then yeah, uh, this plus has to change. Yeah, but I, actually, I don't know the answer. Um, yeah, I haven't looked into, I haven't thought about it uh, deeply, yes. No, since you, you yeah. are, again, have a model where it has both electromagnetic and uh, uh, mm -hmm. energy, and so I was trying to see whether you uh, looked mm -hmm. into that ratio since you were dealing with an effective, and maybe mm -hmm. you have some scenarios. Oh, I see, I see, I see. Yeah, so, and, yeah, in my scenario, I just uh, um, no, you assume, assume for something. simplicity, yeah, yeah, but certainly yeah, no, those, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, so certainly there's an interesting direction to think about. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Good job. Yep. Thank On you. The page, yeah, this page, I'm just a little confused. You In start this with the uh, component, chi one, chi zero. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, the yeah. ratio is R1. Right, right, right. R1 equal one means you just Discard the uh, two components. 
just one component, component right? Yes, right, right, right. So in this case, is I'm thinking of a single component limit. So only the chi one consists the dark matter. Yeah, this is the, the limit. Yeah, limit of the single component dark matter. I mean, you're right. You're perfectly right. Yes. Uh, yeah. And the mass you said the chi zero. This is chi one. I mean. Yeah, yeah. So the mass of chi one, I, I said the mass of chi zero is one hundred mb, but this doesn't have any meaning in this part, right? Right. You're right. Is is this your question? Yes, I'm I'm uh, sure to understand uh, what number means. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Sorry, sorry. Yes, yes, you're right. So it's better to remove this uh here. Yeah, m chi zero equal one hundred mb. So I'm basically considering the single compo component case. Yes, you're right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, I guess uh, time's up, and uh, so let me stop recording. Uh,